Deputy Five, Lord Autumn. Um, I'd like to apologise for not being able to speak at second reading, but I was overseas. I'd been invited to speak at the National Assembly in Seoul. And relevant to this amendment, amongst the subjects we discussed was the hacking of cryptocurrency, cyber crime, human rights violations, and the failure to apply proper sanctions. North Korea, I declare an interest, a non-financial interest, as the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on North Korea, has produced, of course, the original playbook for many of the evasive actions that are being taken by other authoritarian regimes in the world. So in moving Amendment 85, I will first of all try to explain its genesis and why I think we need to strengthen the sanctions regime. Although it stands alone on the marshalled list, it's not unconnected to the important issues raised in the committee thus far, especially on amendments that were debated here on Tuesday, including anti-money laundering measures and strategic lawsuits against public participation, SLAPs. On Tuesday, it was the noble Lord, Lord Ponsonby, who said that the House is fortunate, and he was right to have the insights and the collective wisdom of noble lords in ensuring that the bill has what he called proper teeth. This amendment, 85, which also bears the names of the noble lord, Lord Coker, the noble lord, Lord Fox, and my noble friend, Lord Stevens of Birmingham, enjoys support from across the House, but it also significantly enjoys support from all sides in another place. And it is designed to give the sanctions regime proper teeth and to deal with dirty money. I suppose, my lords, I should say I have skin in the game as someone who is himself sanctioned by authoritarian regimes, a distinction I share with the Right Honourable Sir Ian Duncan Smith MP, and it was he who suggested that I meet with Dame Margaret Hodge MP, former chair of the House of Commons uh, Public Accounts Committee and who served on the Standing Committee in another place on this bill. Dame Margaret and Margaret Mollett from her office have been tireless in their efforts to build a non-partisan alliance championing greater accountability and countering malign forces which manipulate and enjoy our British freedoms while collaborating in the denial of those same freedoms to millions of people elsewhere. I've also subsequently met with Helen Taylor, senior legal researcher at Spotlight on Corruption, with her colleagues and with Maria Nizero, a research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute Centre for Financial Crime and Security Studies. I draw attention to her important paper, How to Seize a Billion, Exploring Mechanisms to Recover the Proceeds of Kleptocracy, and it was recently published in the New Law Journal. I've also previously met with Bill Browder, the author of Red Notice, and with Evgenia Karamurza, the wife of Vladimir Karamurza, a British citizen and champion of democracy in Russia, who only last week was sentenced to 25 years in jail on so-called charges of treason. In a book published last year, I also detailed our state's failures to hold to account those responsible for international crimes, notably genocide, and the way in which we persist in doing business as usual with the actors who perpetrate many of those crimes. Yesterday, my lords, I was extremely fortunate and grateful to the noble Lord, Lord Sharp of Epsom, the Minister, for providing the opportunity to discuss Amendment 85 with him and to be able to explore some of the issues which inevitably arrive, everything from proportionality, which was touched on in the previous group of amendments, and capacity for enforcement all the way through to European Union requirements on mandatory disclosure. He was accompanied by the able Corrie Monaghan from the Bill team, and I was glad to learn from her about the continuing work going on right across departments to address the issues raised in the amendment, and indeed the willingness of the government to consider what more might be done, and indeed in Amendment 91A, which comes later, uh, I know that the noble Lord does try to plug some gaps and bring clarity, though I think the Minister will himself say it doesn't actually do anything specifically that is new. My amendment, 85, seeks to go further than that and to require disclosure and enable asset recovery under the Proceeds of Crime Act and where there's been deliberate concealment rather than disclosure. My Lords, this committee is well aware that Russia's 
illegal and tragic invasion of Ukraine on February the 24th last year exposed the uncomfortable reality that our country has been welcoming Russian money and at times facilitating the concealment of illicit funds, earning us the infamous nickname, of course, of London grad. Now, the Minister knows that, and I recognise and applaud the Government's introduction of two welcome pieces of legislation aimed at combating economic crime and enforcing transparency. Its swift legislative action in the form of the Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act and this Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill are a good beginning. But, my Lords, as the noble Lord Lord Coker said in the earlier group of amendments, we still have to go further. Amendment 85 allows the seizure of assets when deliberate attempts have been made to escape the enforcement of sanctions. I should add that in addition to these important legislative efforts, the government's imposed sanctions on nearly 1,500 individuals, including 120 oligarchs with a net worth of over £140 billion. But, my Lord, put that into perspective. Put it into perspective. The Office of Sanctions Implementation, OFSI, reports that, in total, assets worth just £18 billion, compared with the £140 billion associated with Russia's regime, have been frozen since the beginning of the war. In the meantime, the oligarchs have found increasingly sophisticated ways to weaken our sanctions response, moving assets just before sanctions hit, exploiting loopholes to put assets out of reach, and concealing assets to hinder the enforcement of sanctions. For example, oligarchs such as Abramovich were able to bypass the sanctions by handing over their wealth and companies to family members just a few weeks before the sanctions hit. In fact, just before the war began, Abramovich restructured at least $4 billion worth of his personal wealth and transferred it to his children, who are now the owners of trusts, luxury yachts, private jets and mansions, all out of reach of UK sanctions. Had Amendment 85 been in place, these funds, which by contrast amount to more than the UK's present commitment in military aid to Ukraine, would not have escaped freezing orders and could have potentially been seized. Let me give the committee another example. Mikhail Fridman's personal assistant, Nagina Zyrova, took control of several entities previously owned by the sanctioned oligarch, including a £65 million mansion in Highgate. She was belatedly sanctioned, but the cost of constantly being one step behind are very clear. Recent investigations by Transparency International UK found that luxury homes worth £700 million, previously linked to sanctioned oligarchs, were not flagged as restricted on the UK property register. And I would love to hear from the noble Lord, Lord Sharp, the Minister, when he comes to reply. Uh, what is being done about that? And what is the current position when it comes to properties registered on that register? And this isn't just about the war in Ukraine. The Minister and I share a passion and a common love for Hong Kong. I'm a patron of Hong Kong Watch. And at an event last night, I pointed out that at least five Hong Kong officials and six legislators that are complicit in the ongoing human rights crackdown currently own property in the UK. I strongly welcomed the Magnitsky sanctions, of course, named for Bill Browder's lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who was tortured to death in pre-trial detention in 2009. I welcome the creation of the Magnitsky sanctions. But the failure to use targeted sanctions against those responsible for the destruction of Hong Kong's freedom underlines the case for parliamentary accountability and oversight of sanctions regime. I find it extraordinary that there is no select committee of either house or a joint committee of both houses that at least meeting in camera is unable to discuss the nature of those Magnitsky sanctions and why they're so random and often arbitrary. Some are included and some are not. Indeed, we even provide red carpet treatment for officials like Christopher Hui, who met three United Kingdom ministers, not just one, but three, last week, while his regime has denied access to Hong Kong's BNOers to more than £2.2 billion of pension savings. 
a letter signed by 110 parliamentarians, including the noble baroness Lady Bennett, who is the chair of the all-party parliament, co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Hong Kong, of which I'm an officer. Uh, 110 parliamentarians have urged the government to undertake an audit of UK assets of Hong Kong and Chinese officials linked to human rights violations. My Lord, no response has been received and no action taken. And I hope that with his customary diligence and commitment, which I applaud, I hope the noble Lord, the Minister, will attend to that and help us to get a response. Clearly, assets are slipping through the cracks of our sanctions regime, but we don't currently have any legislative tools to seize assets that remain concealed. Amendment 85 proposes a minor but significant change to our current legislation, which would put us on the front foot in pursuing sanctioned assets. The amendment has what Lord Ponsonby said on Tuesday are teeth and would help us seize concealed assets by expanding the scope of sanctions evasion. Evasion is already, of course, a criminal offence in the UK. By extending the definition of what constitutes evasion, we can increase the pressure on those who seek to conceal their assets here. Specifically, my lords, the amendment would require all designated individuals to declare any assets they control in the UK to OFSI. They would also be required to provide a list of assets held in the six months prior to designation and failure to disclose these assets within a specified time frame would be criminalised as a form of sanctions evasion. And as a result, undisclosed assets would be made susceptible to seizure using existing procedures under the Proceeds of Crime Act. These procedures already have safeguards in place for courts to ensure that a person isn't simply arbitrarily deprived of their private property. I know that's an issue that the Minister is rightly concerned about, and I would be too. It would be disproportionate, and it would not be in the public interest. Uh, and I would therefore be very open, if this amendment doesn't entirely achieve that purpose, to having further discussions with the noble Lord, the Minister, as we move from committee to report to ensure that it achieves that objective. Now, addressing another point raised with me by the Minister yesterday, this amendment would also provide greater transparency about what assets are caught by sanctions as it places the onus on the sanctioned individual to report their assets to the authorities. This would allow OFSI to ensure better compliance with the sanctions regime and give law enforcement agencies valuable intelligence to tackle evasion. And of course, therefore, it deals with the capacity issue that many noble laws have raised. It's clear that our law enforcement agencies are currently struggling to take effective action against oligarch assets because they lack time and they lack resources to trace the assets. With this amendment, we would put the odds more in their favour as the oligarchs would have to disclose their assets up front. This would help meet the urgent need of targeting sanctioned Russian assets, but the amendment also has within its sight the longer-term need to strengthen all of our sanctions regimes and to enhance the fight against corruption. My Lords, let me draw to a close by referring to best practice elsewhere. Our allies have already taken steps to move from freeze to seize. Last year, the European Union introduced a similar duty to disclose sanctioned assets and sanctions evasion, and it's been standardised as a criminal offence across all member states. The EU Commission has committed to work with international partners to seize more than 19 billion euros worth of Russian oligarchs' funds for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Meanwhile, my lords, our government's asking the taxpayer to foot the bill. That isn't to say that our efforts in support of Ukraine are not highly commendable. It's something else I would very much applaud the government for having done. It's something to be proud of that the UK has come only second to the USA in its contributions. In 2022, the UK committed £2.3 billion in military aid, as well as £220 million in humanitarian assistance. But, my Lords, this amendment would open a potential route to hold to account some of those who have been responsible for all the human misery and the economic damage that has been inflicted on so many. They are the people who should pay. And let me underline again, none of the £18 billion has been frozen so far. None of the £140 billion has been frozen. And it's time that it was. 
I urge the noble Lord the Minister to continue the discussions about what more can be done and to give serious consideration between now and report stage to including this amendment or something like it in this bill as it proceeds to the statute books. My Lords, I beg to move. Yeah. Yeah. Amendment proposed after clause 180, insert the new change 